In Las Vegas in 1994, before his rematch with Julian Jackson, a man considered his equal as a power puncher, Gerald McClellan, inserted a tape into his hotel room VCR. It was common for fighters to watch tapes of their opponents as they studied them pre-fight. But on this tape was footage of a different kind of fighting. As he watched, his coach Stan Johnson walked into the room. To Stan's surprise on the TV was a video of a man with a stocking over his head, watching two dogs tear at each other. It was an illegal dog fight, and the stocking-clad man was Gerald himself, hiding his identity in case someone ever found the tape. A year later, on February 25, 1995, the two-time middleweight champion was down on one knee blinking hard after knockdown. The strange blinking was caused by what would turn out to be a blood clot that would leave him almost completely invalid. But in the moment, no one had a clue and it seemed like he was quitting. It's one of the most bizarre scenes I've ever seen. In one corner, they've got Gerald McClellan over in the corner there with doctors trying to uh, make sure he's okay. The crowd cheered hard for their home favorite, Nigel Benn, the biggest victory of his career. The victory would soon be soured two weeks later by the news that Gerald was rendered completely blind, partially immobile, and with limited comprehension. Though the loss didn't do anything to damage Gerald's legacy, soon another revelation of his character and personal life would. His alleged penchant for dogfighting brought a wave of hate on top of the sympathy for what became of the once indomitable fighter. Real quick, remember to hit the bell, like, subscribe, and comment if you like the content. It really helps. Thank you. But before we get into the video, here's a quick word from today's sponsors, Exter. If you're looking to up your game when it comes to wallets, bags, and accessories, then Exter could be the brand for you. Not only did they invent the first trackable wallet, their gear is sleek and slim, made from sustainable and environmentally friendly materials, and comes with protection from wireless skimming built in. If you want a slim line way to carry your cards and cash, you can check out the Parliament Wallet, made from certified premium leather with space for 12 cards and RFID blocking as standard to foil any attempts at wireless theft of your details. Or you could try the aluminum card holder with the same capacity and security features but made from space grade 6061 T6 aluminum. All of their options are half the size of a conventional wallet but still have more than enough space for all your cards and cash. They also offer products made from carbon fiber as well as backpacks, key cases, tracker cards, and much more. Whether it's laptop power banks, tool cards, tech cases, or a camera cube to store your photography equipment, there is every chance that you will find something to suit your needs. So, whether you are interested in sleek designs, high quality materials, advanced safety and tracking features, or any combination of these things, use my code in the description below to get an additional 5% discount. And this is on top of the sales that they are running right now. With 20% off between January 24th and February 15th for their Valentine's Day sale, you cannot go wrong. So visit their website and remember to use my code to get an extra 5% discount on top. Thanks again to today's sponsor, Exter, and now, let's get back to the video. Unbeknownst to many, dogfighting is nothing new in rural American communities. It traces its roots back to 1817, when crossbreeds of bulldogs and terriers were brought to America from England or Ireland. Dogfighting was a sensation with regular matches being held in many cities nationwide. While this barbaric sport was outlawed in the 20th century, it continued to flourish underground. The pastime, originally popular in white communities in the South, had gained rapid and immense popularity in the African-American communities. To such an extent that it is still a widespread underground sport, despite being a felony offense in all 50 states. Many young boys now ask for pit bulls instead of a football or basketball, and just as many are desensitized to watching them maim and maul each other. One infamous case that gained national attention was that of Michael Vick and his Bad News Kennels. The NFL star was apprehended and imprisoned for almost 21 months for his involvement in the large-scale operation. Despite accounts of him enjoying the violent dogfights and executing underperforming dogs by drowning or electrocution, the debacle did open up a debate 
about selective empathy, specifically when it came to dogs. But in a lesser known case before Michael Vicks, another African American millionaire athlete faced allegations of taking joy in watching pit bulls fight to the death. None other than boxer Gerald the G-Man McClellan. To me, knocking somebody out is like, it's a, it's a good feeling. Reigning triumphant in 31 out of 34 fights in his seven year career, Gerald McClellan was one of the next superstars in the middleweight division, even more impressively in the division's golden age. A division stacked with the likes of Roy Jones Jr., James Tony, Chris Eubank, and Nigel Benn to name a few. McClellan was a boxing prodigy as an amateur, notably having beaten Roy Jones Jr. in an amateur fight at the Golden Gloves Nationals and becoming a national champion in 1987. A year later, he beat Roy Jones Jr. again in an Olympic trial semifinal. Oddly though, Jones was selected to represent the United States at the Seoul Olympics where he won gold. In the pros, Gerald was a product of Detroit's famed Kronk Gym under the tutelage of trainer Emmanuel Stewart, who had a record of training power punchers like Tommy the Hitman Hearns. He equally taught Gerald how to be a menacing puncher. Gerald was known for his lethal power, having one of the highest first round knockout ratios in the history of boxing. Stepping into the ring with a vicious mindset, he won all of his first 10 fights via round one knockouts. He had a fantastic record, losing only two out of his first 29 fights. He took a shot for the WBO middleweight title against another puncher of the same caliber, John the Beast Mugabe, in 1991. In a dominant performance, Gerald knocked him down three times in round one and won the match and the title by the three knockdown rule. Then came another big hit in 1993, the battle for the title of WBC middleweight championship, when Gerald was put up against the hardest hitting fighter of that time. Julian the Hawk Jackson. This fight was indeed a mega fight, with the most exciting middleweight champions pitted against each other. Gerald, without wasting any time, pelted Julian with consecutive attacks, and Julian, despite landing some clean hits on Gerald, failed to knock him down. It was an all-out brawl, and Julian eventually had the upper hand as he landed some hard blows in the second and third rounds. Gerald, desperate for breath and wrapped in rage, started once again till he threw the lethal left hook that knocked Jackson out of the ring and into the first row. Gerald ended up winning the title in the fifth round. He defended it thrice, including in his rematch with Jackson, which ended in a first round knockout. Gerald settled into the champ life and embraced his new persona as the G-Man. He was obsessed with the color green and he'd wear flashy green suits and drive a green Mercedes Benz. In his private life, much of his time was spent on womanizing and on the other statistic hobby he had since childhood, and all the new money would allow him to indulge fully. Stan Johnson, Gerald's coach described Gerald as an aggressive and violent man in and out of the ring. Most violent man that ever put on a pair of gloves. That probably had something to do with Gerald growing up on the wrong side of Freeport, Illinois, where dogfighting was awfully common. Gerald, molded by the harsh environment, grew a peculiar interest in the dogs, as he admired their unwavering tenacity and their disregard for pain. Stan Johnson, who was also Gerald's good friend and sidekick on his barbaric adventures, revealed that despite being afraid and sick of the activity, he got into it after witnessing it himself. Johnson further said that these fights, lasting for about 45 minutes, were so bloody that Gerald often came home covered in blood. Stan said that Gerald often enjoyed the moments, chanting, shake, baby shake, as his dog got hold of its opponent's neck and tore at its throat. He had trained his dog, Deuce, a beige and white pit bull, to be just like him. Gerald loved Deuce to such an extent that he had a tattoo of him, but he only had that kind of affection for Deuce. He never had the same regard for any other dog. Stan had another tale of Gerald's morbid fascination with dog fighting. The story had Gerald walking into a dog store and claiming he needed a dog to take care of. Yeah, you got a good home now. The owner remarked as he gave Gerald a black Labrador. Later, Gerald took the dog home, walked it down to his basement, and taped its mouth shut. He then unleashed Deuce on the defenseless Labrador. Get him! Gerald would then check his watch to time how long it took Deuce to finish off the Labrador. 
According to Stan, Gerald defended the act as sparring for his dog. And even though the Labrador probably didn't stand a chance in a fair fight, he taped the Labrador's mouth shut so Deuce, a championship dog, wouldn't have any scratches and bites on fight day. He held a steadfast belief that his dog needed to kill something every day, and just like a fighter sparring for a bout, Deuce would keep his skills sharp. His love for the blood sport even often had him betting his own purse money in the projects of Chicago. $10,000 wagers in crowds full of gangbangers and drug dealers. Donnie, the black battle cat Pendleton, a first cousin of Gerald, would recall his obsession with pit bulls and how they'd take them with them to Gerald's training camps in Detroit. Gerald would drive in his green Mercedes with a big truck in front of them with the dogs in cages. According to him, Gerald reasoned that if he had to fight for a living, then the dogs did too. According to Donnie, Deuce was once winning a particular fight that Gerald had money on. All of a sudden, the other dogs started to rip Deuce's throat out. In a panic, in fear of losing his most beloved dog, Gerald told the dude, Stop the fight! And the dude said, Nah, man. No, man, you started the fight. Gerald said, You stop this motherfucking fight! Stop the fight! I quit. Here's your money. Gerald, dressed in a snazzy leather suit, picked the bloody dog up, slung him over his shoulders, and put Deuce in the back of his Mercedes. On the drive home, he got in the back seat and sewed Deuce's severed neck himself while he cried and swore he'd never put Deuce through something like that again. Such was his attachment to Deuce. Unlike Deuce, though, another dog on his roster once lost a $7,000 fight and got no sympathy from Gerald. Allegedly, the other guy said, Hey, you want to wash your dog off before you put him in your truck? Gerald pulled a 9mm out of his back pocket, aimed it at the dog's head, and killed him on the spot. He remarked, Put that mother in a plastic bag. I don't need him if they can't fight no better than that. I don't need no mother dog that can't fight. A thesis on his sentiments towards canines. Stan and Donnie remembered another crazy outing with Gerald. One time in Florida, after a visit to a mall, the flamingos outside caught Gerald's attention. After exclaiming, Right, watch this, watch this! Gerald sped up and plowed right through one. He allegedly got a real kick out of it. He laughed and checked to see if his crew found it funny too. They didn't. It wasn't just a psycho move, it was a convictable offense too. But that was the Gerald the cameras didn't show you. A man who sought violence. He ran over a few more flamingos that evening. While all was going smoothly for him, Gerald decided to part ways with Emmanuel Stewart in 1994 in a dispute over money. Many would speculate the split had something to do with Gerald's involvement with the ever money hungry Don King. Don was on the market for a new cash cow fighter, while Mike Tyson was in prison and it was clear to see that Gerald was a star. While Manny wanted Gerald to be careful and take it slow, Gerald now wanted to see through the bigger fights as fast as possible. After parting ways with Manny, decided to go up against the super middleweight WBC champion, Nigel Benn. Victory over Benn would almost guarantee a super fight with Roy Jones Jr. and a chance for Gerald to avenge his Olympic snub. The fight, billed as sudden impact, happened on February 25, 1995, in London, with 10,000 people in the audience and 17 million at home. Gerald was the 1-3 favorite. Just 35 seconds into the contest, Gerald knocked Ben out of the ring into television monitors. Unlike the regular 10 count for a knockdown, you get 20 when you get knocked out of the ring. And after 13 seconds, Ben got up and clambered back into the ring. The fight continued as Ben, swinging wildly, started to work his way back into the fight, albeit with multiple illegal rabbit punches. A blow to the back of the head. The ref did nothing to stop this. Gerald held himself to the eighth round when he knocked Nigel down again, but Nigel got back up. In the ninth, Ben was exhausted and throwing haymakers to survive. After a wild swing and a miss, Ben's head clattered into McClellan's. Gerald was visibly badly hurt by this. In the 10th round, Nigel knocked Gerald down to one knee. A close-up of his face showed him blinking hard from the blow. The commentator described it as the strangest knockdown he had ever seen. He got up, 
but was shortly after knocked down to one knee again. This time, he was counted out. Amidst accusations of quitting, the crowd going crazy, and an elated Ben being interviewed, Jero collapsed in his corner after claiming he felt like there was running water inside his head. Gerald later came to in the ambulance and asked what the freak happened. He assumed that he must have been knocked out cold. This was followed by the news that he had quit, a violation of the warrior code. Gerald turned to Donnie thinking Coach Stan was lying, but Donnie confirmed it to be true, for all they could tell. Gerald had dropped to one knee and stayed down for the full 10 count. With the knowledge they had at the moment, Gerald in there or any boxing fan's books was a quitter. Later in the hospital, a battered Nigel Ben arrived in an ambulance and was wheeled into the cubicle next to Gerald. Don King showed up after Ben, and even after seeing the sorry state of his big money prospect, King turned to Coach Stan and Donnie and a tersely remarked, Gerald quit. Man, he quit like a dog. Gerald underwent surgery for the blood clot in his brain to be removed. After suffering brain damage, he spent 11 days in a coma and woke up blind, partially deaf, with short-term memory loss. Further revelations came to prove that the blood clot wasn't a direct result of the Ben fight, but from an injury he'd been hiding for some time. Tariq Salmasi, a fellow Kronk gym fighter, revealed Gerald's habit of hiding his injuries. He spoke in an interview about a sparring session between both fighters, where Salmasi hit Gerald with a jab that made him start to blink hard. Gerald was hurt, but he only admitted it to Salmasi in private. Salmasi later saw the same blinking in the fight with Ben and instantly knew something was very wrong. Gerald also reportedly complained about regular headaches after the Julian Jackson fight, which revealed that he was hurt back then as well. When the news that Gerald was finished as a fighter broke, Coach Johnson would catch heat for not throwing in the towel when he could see his fighter was struggling, a decision he claims he will regret for the rest of his life. Ever since Gerald McClellan has been under the care of his sister, Lisa McClellan, who revealed in a documentary that he is not entirely deaf, but struggles to comprehend when spoken to. Six years later in 2001, after some tip-offs, the police raided one of McClellan's properties in Texas, a kennel operation that bred and trained dogs to fight. Gambling fights were frequently held on the premises as well. They found scarred pit bulls in cages and equipment used to train them for maximum aggression in fights. They also found meticulous records that Gerald had kept on the dogs and their fighting records. Though it is unclear whether Gerald was still actively involved given his condition, the news came as a shock to many. Henceforth, dog fighting would now come up almost every time his name was brought up. The revelations of his bad habit divided opinions on his legacy and character. Though many can separate the artist from their art, a good chunk of people lost sympathy for him entirely. The blood and gore of dogfighting might just have been the impetus that made him such a vicious opponent in the ring. All in all, the knowledge of the G-Man, his background and his vices paint a picture of a great fighter but a terrible human being. A story of violence and how easy it came to him.